Today's session on transforming customer experiences, looking at enlightening discussion. I think your line is breaking a bit. Good evening, clients. Can you hear me, please? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You can hear me? Yes. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay. Someone says my question. Oh, who is it? I can't hear anything. Can you hear me? Can somebody hear me? Can somebody hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, sure. Okay. So if I can go ahead. Yes, can go ahead. Okay. A bit louder. So seven. Okay, all right. So, good evening and welcome. Please, if you can hear me, if you can hear me, kindly type Bob, Bob in the chat window. Just be up, Bob. Then I can go full speed. Bob, Bob, Bob. I just need Bob. Bob will work. Bob. Okay. So, good evening. There's an echo. There's something in the background. Am I missing something? Okay, it's gone. Okay, all right. Good evening and welcome. Good evening and welcome to this session on um, customer experience. Um, this is something I'm particularly passionate about. And for those who've known me for a decade or two, you know, I'm very excited when I have to speak about Customer experience matters, not, not because I don't like sales, not, not because I don't like trade marketing, not because I don't like branding or advertising, but because as I travel across Africa, I realize that the customer experience challenges confronting African countries tend to be shockingly homogeneous. So I'm going to start by explaining that I put together the slides a couple of months ago 
But in the last few weeks, I've been traveling in, in East Africa. And so just yesterday, I felt inspired to go in a slightly different direction. And I'll explain with the next slide. Please show the mangoes, please. Clarence, the mangoes. Can anybody hear me at all? This is scary. Hear yeah, you, uh, just uh, the internet loop, but it, it should change soon. Okay, all right. So colleagues, two nights ago, I had the pleasure of having dinner with one of the Chartered Institute of Marketing colleagues. So when we finished, and characteristically, I asked for some for some mango. I typically will not eat mango or too much of such stuff. But the lady brought me this plate of mango. These mangoes are as hard as a stone, totally unripe, and very sour to consume. So I started shouting, please come, please come, please come. And I called them and I said, the lady brought me the man, where is she? The man said he's not around. So the man came and said to me that he's sorry. Then he said to me that he will replace the mangoes. So he went and brought me mangoes that were still not too sweet, but a little more ripe than this set over here. So... As I tried to eat the mangoes, I was thinking that the lady brought the mangoes only because she felt compelled to sell me something. Because for what it's worth, if the mangoes were not ripe, you didn't have to force it on me. A few weeks ago, I was in another East African country, and I stayed in the most luxurious hotel on a game resort. The first night, my bathroom flooded. That same evening, they gave me the most horrendous room service. So as I went through these experiences, I started thinking, wow, we are in an artificial intelligence age. And I'm wondering whether we need the robots to come and take over everything that's happening with the humans. Or whether we still have some fundamental challenges with understanding how to configure customer experiences. So if you look at the slide before we all started, there was something about traditional and contemporary approaches. Colleagues, here is my humble suggestion to you. Working in this space for 23, 24, 25 years, I've come to the inescapable conclusion that whilst the continent has made tremendous progress in understanding customer experience issues, we still have a tremendously long way to go. Now, when we talk about traditional customer experience delivery, there are certain typologies we see. When we talk about contemporary approaches, there are certain typologies I think we should also see. Now, for those of you listening to me now who are operating in traditional mode, Till today, which is 25th May, 2023, I think, you are still in organizations where the customer experience is seen as a cost issue. How much will it cost? What do they do for us? How do they create value? How do they contribute to the bottom line? And you are, you are in an eternal battle with your management to even make customer experience a necessity. Then you have the blessing of organization like APSA, where the customer experience person is a senior, senior, senior management person. So that's at the other extreme. So for those of you who are still in this step one traditional mode, where customer experience is seen as cost, I wish you all the best. But I pray that maybe you can play back this recording when I'm done to get some people to come along. Even if you've migrated from this step one, which is customer experience as cost, you only may be in step two, where customer experience is seen as necessity. So in this particular regard, you are doing it because some of your competitor also opened a customer experience unit. 
And one of your clients said that, oh, when you go there, please, they are serving us better. So here, customer experience is only seen as necessity. So be nice to the customers, greet them when they come. You have limited empowerment in staff. The training is just generic. There's no nuanced training to meet the capacity building needs of the employees of the organization and so on and so forth. So colleagues, we have a basic diagnostic tool we use to check where you are on this customer experience continuum. So after I'm done today, if you feel like you want to do a self-examination, please let us know and I'll come with the Chartered Institute of Marketing to come and assist you in that general regard. Now, if you've managed to go beyond step two and you're in step three, then you are beginning to employ the models and the tools that world-leading customer experience, customer-centric organizations are migrating towards. Here, customer experience is seen as competitive advantage. So here is a strategic measure and it is used as a key value driver for the business. Let me explain. Key value driver for the business. Here, staff are empowered to take care of customers. You have nuanced training like achieving service excellence. There's longer term focus. There's direct involvement of management in customer experience issues. And generally speaking, the policy is to exceed customer ex expectations and be strategic in your orientation. Of course, once you move towards such contemporary approaches, the results are enhanced reputation for service, the staff are more likely to stay because they are empowered and they love the job. You get high levels of repeat business if your product is solid and the engagement to the company is generally positive. But the utopian level you all need to push for because you came tonight are branded customer experiences where customer experience is the essential living expression of the organization brand. So here, excellent customer experience resonates throughout the organization. So everybody from CEO to front desk executive is empowered to deliver the brand at the highest level possible at each customer interface. Now, when you move into branded customer experience, what happens is that the organizational DNA permeates through every single service touch point, and every touch point reflects the brand. The brand promise is reflected also in internal policies and procedures. This is so important because if you don't have solid internal customer experience regimes, you can never have solid external customer experience delivery. So here, there is tailored brand education for everybody. I was in a presentation earlier today and the chairman of my university council was saying, colleagues, if you take the university values, how is it reflected in the way you handle the students? How is it reflected in the way we live from day to day. And I was so excited because my council chair, Professor Ewusabu Asari, is a population demography man. He hasn't read PhD in marketing, he's not a chartered marketer. But even he was asking us today at the Ghana Communication Technology University that when you take GCTU values, how do we live them on the day to day basis? Then he said something that was even more profound. And I was so excited. He was saying it because he said, how does living the values also connect to the vision and the mission of the organization? I could have left up and carried him because these are such fundamental questions. And I promise you, for those of you who are here tonight, if I start debating you on these issues, you might find that there are gaps you could also go and fill. So tonight I'm here to speak about how to reach this utopian customer experience level. But since I'm a teacher, let me do some basic definitional issues. Customer experience is essentially the sum of all interactions between a customer and your organization. 
So whether you are at APSA, you are at Gando Cosmetics, whether you are at NPRA or you are at DVLA, customer experience is the blend of your organization's physical performance and the emotions you create at each customer interface measured against customer expectations throughout all those points of interaction. So let me simplify this because one thing I've noticed is that in this increasingly technological, digital, artificial intelligence age, I found interestingly that whilst these are excellent tools for enhancing the customer experience, for improving your marketing, for improving your sales, certain things are still basic common sense. Let me give you an example. A lot of us work for organizations where we've made the most flamboyant promises on our website. Flamboyant. We've made wild promises. Now, when you take 50% of that organization, number one, they may not be even aware of the promises you've made on your own website. Forget deliver. I mean, deliver is step two. They may not be aware. Number two, even if they are aware, they have not been given the requisite capacity to deliver on those service promises that are domiciled on your website. Now, how artificial intelligence will solve this, I'm not too sure. So whilst I'm a bit advocate of technology and all this, there are still basic service design issues, basic service blueprinting issues that we need to buckle down and try to fix. So it is the sum of all the interactions between a customer and your organization, and then your fiscal performance and the emotions you create measured against all customer expectations across all your points of interaction. So here's what it is. As you listen to me tonight, do you know all the customer expectations you've created through your service promises, through your various customer touch points? Do you know the latest version of the promises on your organizational website? Do you know what you promised in the daily graphic advert 17 days ago? Are you aware? Because for what it's worth, if you are not even privy to the promises that have been made, how can you conceivably be equipped to deliver them? So, since this is such an interesting proposition, let me quickly move to what we need to do internally before we can get external customer experience, discipline, and excellence. So please, I want to ask a few questions. I hear I have 45 minutes. If I have a long way, we'll be dialoguing as we go. Clarence, should I dialogue or I should finish first? That monologue thing, sometimes it worries me, but should I continue? Let me continue. So colleagues, um, I've, I, I've done a couple of books in the past, and there are two things I always discuss when I discuss customer service and customer experience in most of my books. Number one, I discuss service rewards and recognition. Number two, I discuss internal customer experience issues. And here is what it is. All the training I'm giving tonight is premised on my experiences across 15, 16 African countries and like 57 or 58 African cities I've actually been to, lived in, and done work in. Now, Here's what I found. Sometimes we suffer from customer experience malaise because there are no rewards for service excellence and there are no penalties for service malfeasance. Why that is, I don't know. This is especially the case in public sector organizations across Africa. I'm not saying they are bad, no. These problems also occur sometimes in private sector organizations as well. So we all suffer from the same malaise. So I always say that if you can, as part of your service design, your customer experience strategy making, always make sure 
that there are conspicuous rewards for extraordinary service performance, and you have clear SLAs, clear SOPs, clear service standards, so that those who keep flouting these standards, after a while, receive the punishment reserved from them from 1 Timothy 5.20. The B part says, them that sin repeatedly, punish openly, that the rest may stand in fear. So there's a point at which you need to meet out some punishment as a deterrent to others want to go down the same negative path. So let me give you a few tips for building solid internal customer experience re 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 regimes. Number one, create internal service standards. Colleagues, it surprises me that this is so basic to customer experience design. And for several organizations, it is still a problem. The same way it was in 1998 as it is in 2023. Colleagues, what is going on? Because at a basic level, once you distill the organizational DNA, once you are clear about your vision, once you are clear about your mission, once you are clear about your corporate values, from this set of organizational artifacts or whatever it is, you should build a set of standards that reflect observable service behaviors that become a common platform for where service is delivered. So define clear standards, for instance, regarding response to emails, messages, phone calls, internal requests. Hold employees accountable for responding to co-workers' communications within a predetermined period of time. This can help to tear down certain silos that exist even within the organization. There should be standards. And the standards relate to how we deliver service to each other within the organization and also how we deliver the experiences to external audiences of the organization. Then this one is interesting. I would respectfully propose that we also establish a performance review process so that different functional teams, their colleagues, can talk openly and honestly about how well they are meeting each other's needs. Wow, this one is so important to me because I've been doing this kind of training for two decades. I'm still doing it today. I'll probably do it again next week. It is so shocking how this issue of siloed thinking, siloed behavior is still prevalent in several institutions across Africa. How that is, I, I will never know. Because every CEO I've met, not for profit, for profit, public sector, they all don't believe in silo business. Meanwhile, underneath them, the thing is still happening. How that is, me, I don't know. The next thing, colleagues, you might consider in solidifying your internal customer experience delivery is the conduct of service. You know, when you speak to customer experience people in Ghana and outside, I mean, one of the standard things you hear is, oh, what's our net promoter score? Or is it going up? Is it coming down? How likely are people to recommend us? Who are detractors? Who are promoters? And a lot of the time, when I hear NPS discussion, I listen quietly. But nine out of ten times, net promoter score discussion relate to external customers. When I ask them things like, have you done an internal climate service service survey for um what's that? No, your your internal customer experience climate is as important as it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sometimes HR sends some questionnaires to find out how we are doing. No. I didn't say HR should come and find out how you're doing. I'm saying that if you are really serious about improving your internal customer experiences, you must have what you call an internal customer management or engagement survey, colleagues, with methods and practices that are as robust and as holistic as your external voice of the customer protocols, net promoter score. So please, be as vigorous about internal customer experience delivery 
as you are about external customer experience delivery. Because if you are doing like a twice yearly customer satisfaction survey internally, it can go a long way towards achieving progress in internal customer satisfaction level. Very, very important. So you do a baseline, maybe mid-year, because we are almost mid-year. You do a tracker at Christmas, and then we, we find a, a way forward. Another way, colleagues, you could consider improving your internal customer experience delivery is through swapping jobs. So you've heard of um, swaps. So with job swapping, employees from a certain department can swap jobs for a week or two to experience the day-to-day -day activities of their fellow workers. I'm not saying you should go there for six months, just to get a sense. Because sometimes when you go and sit in the teller's booth, you will not be there with the teller again. All the pressure I give the tellers, you realize that you as a colleague internal department are not providing the requisite services for them to deliver excellent Hello, can I go ahead? Who is that? Okay, so Timothy, can you move? Okay. So one one other thing with customer experience is that um, some studies have been done globally that suggest that failing to deliver a high quality customer experience can result in an erosion of your customers, your customer base by as much as fifty percent over a five year period. Here's one thing that also happens to today, which surprises me, given that I've been around the circuit for a while. So several organizations still don't have any way of tracking customer attrition that occurs as a result of poor customer experience delivery. I'm telling you, there are some organizations who say, we'll record the phone call for training purposes, fine. But let's take a public university. If your front desk person is rude, how will you track that one? If your front desk person causes a wealthy Nigerian man to walk away with two daughters, who could give your university $100,000 in four years? How would you track that one? So it's important as customer experience people, when we are making the case to management that we find a certain quantifiable base to explain to management that if we don't follow our advice on superior customer experience delivery, we will suffer financial loss. After experiencing poor customer experiences, 68% of consumers do business with a competitor. Now, if you are blessed to be an organization like DVLA, you don't need to worry. But if you are like GCTU, you are like Gandor, you are like APSA, you are like Standard Chartered, then you can't afford to be careless because in the domain in which you operate, there are competitors. And if you don't deliver to their standard, they will defect. Poor customer experience has caused 78% of consumers to bail out on a transaction. This is all verifiable research. Given the opportunity, 60% of consumers would try a new brand for a better service experience. So, we need to try and identify some key customer experience killers so that as I begin to wrap up, we can all avoid them. So I made some few notes here. But before I get to the killers, let me ask you a question. When I'm done, I want you to answer some of these questions for me. And I'll start with your digital platforms. When was the last time you visited your own website, my dear colleagues? When you got there, please, I want to ask you, were you able to navigate around with ease? Can you follow a path of inquiry and see where it leads? Does anything confuse you on your own website? Can you easily find the information you're looking for? 
Are there any obsolete items on your website or are all items up to date? Do your videos and your pages load quickly and do they work correctly? Listen, it's very important that we do some of this critical introspection. Now, if it's not digital, it's brick and mortar. Can you answer this question? How does your signage look, my dear colleagues? And now I pray that there are some corporate comms and brand comms people also here. Is your signage clear and fresh looking? Does it work properly? You'll be amazed how many perspex signs have bulbs that are dead. So at night, the, the, the light is half half, and you are still working in the morning and going and coming and going for lunch and eating, watching, and coming back to signage that is broken. What does your landscaping look like? Is the grass overgrown? Is parking easy? What's your first impression on entering? Because you have only five to 10 seconds to make a first time positive and lasting impression in any service encounter. Are the employees dressed appropriately? These are all questions you must answer. So if you don't answer these questions, then what's going to happen is that you'll be creating customer experience killers. And that's thing I want you to consider as you listen tonight is, what type of organization am I in? Am I in an inside-out organization or am, I, or am I in an outside-in organization? Colleagues, let me share with you some characteristics of inside-out organizations. Here, you have customer segments, which is a total blessing. You have distribution channels. You have technology integration. You have good forecasting. You have capacity building. Excellent, excellent, excellent. But when you are outside in, then you create what we call customer experience intent because you use the data from what customer needs to develop your customer experience intent statement. You do what we call journey mapping. Take a customer, you map their whole journey with you and ensure that at every critical touch point, you are delivering world-class service. You are hiring service-oriented and competent people. You have emotional intelligence working at the highest levels in order to amaze your customers. I respectfully recommend to you that if you can, you adopt an outside-in orientation to really satisfy your customers. Let me wrap up by giving you 10 key customer expectations of the African consumer today. Now, I'm going to share these things with you based on research, anecdotal evidence, working as a marketing practitioner, working as a marketing consultant, working as a marketing scholar. The first requirement I want to share with you for today's African consumer, as we begin to wrap, is most of them want immediacy, immediacy, immediacy. Now, in this AI technology age, I'd be surprised if you were surprised about this requirement, immediacy. Customers want it now. Unless they want it later, in which case they want it at a specific time, in a specific location, with a call to verify exactly when, so they don't forget. Immediacy, immediacy, immediacy. Number two, ease of use. Customers want ease of use, African customers. African customers, I'm sorry to announce, don't like to follow directions. So if you want customers to do something, in Africa in particular, Make sure the process is easy, so obvious, and so intuitively clear that they'll be able to follow the path you've laid out as easily as what finds the value floor. Don't expect consumers to think. Let me repeat. Don't expect consumers to think. I'm always amazed when I see people go into all sorts of funny arguments with customers over, why didn't you do this, you did that? Listen, I agree with you, services are co-produced. I agree with you. Customer has a role, provider has a role. 
But customers don't like to think too much. Please, as much as possible, simplify the process. Number three, African customers want speed. Most customers don't want to take a ton of time deciding what to buy. They check out with their friends, they go to social media, they look at ratings, they do research, they go to websites to make their decisions. Once the decision is made, they want to be able to pull the trigger quickly. Don't introduce any impediments into the buying process. Let me repeat. Don't introduce impediments into the buying process. It is counterintuitive. It is wrong. Number four, African consumers want authenticity. No gimmicks, no games, no fine print. Don't say things like, oh, didn't you read the bottom of the advert? Oh, there was some one line there. Oh, that one line said that we will not do this for you. Are you serious? So the advert was font size 42. The warning was in font size 5. And you want me to see the font size 5, which was embedded at the bottom of the print commercial. Whereas the main advert was font size 42. Please, don't, don't these tricks, the, the world we live in now, it will just go against you. They want straight talk, no stories. This means all your touch points, your website, your stories, your adverts need to be using the same real time information. Don't lie to them because they will find out. Let me repeat don't lie to them because they will find out. The next one is they won't care. If customers merely want a transaction, they can buy online. Apart from anything else, they want to be treated like human beings, like you. Consumers have feelings, emotions, and dreams. Don't turn them into some non-identifiable segment. You know the way we like segmentation in marketing, big, big words. Segments are good, but they are human beings in the segments. So they, 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 they enjoy individualized care if you can deliver it to them. Next thing they want is high knowledge. Please, as for knowledge, I've discussed it for 20 years. So if you've met me before, you know this one is my baby. Too many customer experience deliverers in Africa are clueless. They've done no benchmarking. They don't understand competitor offerings. They don't, they don't understand changing customer dynamics. They don't know industry trends and they are standing there trying to deliver service to you. It is problematic. Your own personal knowledge store must be world class. Organizational knowledge must be world class. Industry knowledge must be world class. And if you can afford to, your understanding of global nuances in relation to your industry also matters. They also want availability, ease of use, and then they also want one-stop shopping if you can afford to. And the last thing they want is problem solving. Let me close by giving you five things you can do. Next slide. Let me now come to my slides. Five things you can do to avoid losing customers. Clarence, are you there? Give me the next slide, and I'll be done in two minutes. Clarence, are you there? Clarence, can you hear me? Okay, so number one, if you are listening to me today, I just want to beg you. I just want to beg you. Tell your institution that Prof. Science is advocating that the first requirement for really, really killing this customer experience thing is developing a passion for moment of truth victories. Moment of truth victories are a certain mindset that enjoins you to deliver the best experience possible in the first 10 to 15 seconds of any service encounter. Once you can achieve this sort of organizational orientation, you're on your way to excellent success. Number two, Clarence, number two. Number two. Clarence, are you there? Are you there? Yes, yes. 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 Number two. Become customer focused. This is obvious, but let me explain it a bit. Listen, if you don't have a mindset that is focused on enhancement, 
and added value delivery, you can't really win in this moment of truth. So yes, my small admonition, do something that adds value at every single moment of truth and customers will eternally look for you and want to do business with you again. Number three, Clarence, are you there? Number three. Number three. Just a bit of literacy. Believe and work hard. Uh, if you will excuse the biblical allusion, um, the Bible says in Proverbs 12, 24 that diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in slave labor. If this applies to finance, accounting, engineering, and to procurement management, it applies even more to customer experience delivery because the challenges of customer experience management in my mind are so many that if you don't essentially have a certain diligent orientation, it's very difficult to shine. So belief and hard work. Number four. Clarence, number four. Keep astute records. You know, it always surprised. Yesterday I was at a certain media house and a guy walked in in a blue shirt and a pair of black trousers. He said, hi, Professor. Yeah, that was what's up today. And then he was dealing with the lady. Then the guy goes, oh, Prof. I sure say, you know, they can me. I said, oh, why? Oh, Prof. I said, ah, chief. Don't you work at Enterprise Life? Aren't you calling me? Oh, bro, sorry, 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 sorry. And I, 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 I laughed because I was wondering whether I wanted a hat, whether I should jump and hold him. Who told you I don't remember you? Listen, in customer experience management, keeping records, databases, customer idiosyncrasies, segment profiles, it is so crucial to be a customer experience champion. You need to keep solid data because it's only in record keeping that you can determine what needs to be changed. So you keep a solid database of everybody you are serving. And then if you can, you must also keep tabs on their changing customer requirements. Habakkuk 2 again says, write the vision, make it plain. You need to keep these things front and center. Last one, number five. Clarence, are you there? Is it that the, okay. Creative. So I, I, I'll, I'll close on this one. My, my, my professor said today, the chairman of my council said today that if GCT is going to excel, we need to be creative. And I agreed with him. We live in a university, work in a university which is two years, two, three quarter years. And you have a competitor like University of Ghana that is 75 and a half years. If you take 72, three quarters from 75, it's over 70 years. In 1998, I worked for an agency that was starting. We had competitors in Akwaje that were 90 years older than us. So when they go home at five, we will stay. We stay till maybe 10 or 11 or maybe 2 a.m. because they have a 90 year gap over you, colleagues. If we are going to be customer experience champions, one thing we have to do is to be exceedingly creative. You must wake up every morning trying to configure new solutions, trying to breed new ideas in order to make you competitive and successful. So if you are not consistently seeking out new information to amaze your customers, then you are failing the organization. I'll close with this exciting scripture from Exodus 35. And if you are not a Christian, please forgive me, but I like using scripture. The Bible says, see the Lord has called by name Bezaliel, the son of Uri, son of the uh, tribe of Judah, and has filled him with the spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship to devise artistic designs. This combination of scale, intelligence, knowledge, and superior craftsmanship, I think is the four-way test for true customer experience champions. So 
I'm going to close on this one and thank you exceedingly for coming. I'll take any question you have and God bless us all. Clarence, I'm done. Uh, we are live on ABC News TV and also on Facebook. We'll take this first question from Mark Mensah. All right, thank you. Thank you for that insightful delivery. And it's well on point. Uh, I'm, I'm most grateful to be part of this lecture. Now, uh, uh, my, my question question is, as a marketer, how do you navigate between defending corporate profit and delivering custom experience? I don't know whether my question is that clear. Hello? How do you navigate between, sorry, between what? There are two scenarios. Defending, between, defending uh -huh. Profit uh -huh. and, and delivering a, 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 a great customer experience because we know that, yes, relationship and other things can help in, in creating or in delivering a better customer experience, but it, it still comes with cost. Hey, were you not here when I was explaining to you that? Financial implications of delivering poor customer experiences. I'm very happy for your question because it goes back to something I've said for maybe a decade or two that marketers must learn to communicate in quantitative language. So if you can't put up a business case for customer experience investments, then you are failing the marketing function yourself. So you need to be able to build a business case. Look, I was last year I was in Zimbabwe for the the African Marketing Confederation Conference, and I told them that, look, nowadays, the most forward-looking chief marketing officers are all customer champions. And the job of a CMO, really, is to pivot the whole C-suite towards customer centricity. And I gave them what old-school marketers do and what contemporary marketers do. They use data, they optimize relationships, they pivot towards the customer. So, actually, Defending company profit and company revenue is actually more successfully done if you attain higher and higher levels of customer centricity. But you need to be able to explain this quantitatively to get the C-suite on board. Lawrence, is that okay? Thank you. Thank you, Clarence. Can you hear me? And good evening, Prof. Good evening, boss. OK, so I, I, I'm just going to ask a question um, in the times that we live and what probably your best tips or pieces of advice will be, especially in the times that we are. I work in finance, uh, and as you know, um, we are in a market or we are in times that well, not exactly unprecedented, but not familiar in quite a while. I'm talking about, you know, the after effects of things like the DDP and things like that. In such times, um, how would you um, advise um, marketers or um, ones in charge of dealing with customers and their expectations and their uncertainty? Mm. What are the things? What are some of the tips or the go-to? things you'd advise uh, marketers in these industries yeah. to to do or to say or to keep their clients informed in these times knowing and that calm, you know and calm them down eh? and calm them down assure them pretty much knowing that quite a lot of the things you'd be seeing are pretty much out of your control very much very much very much so you're in finance yeah. Asking me to help you to explain to customers. Are you done, sir? I'm done, Prof. So I'm in okay. finance picking your mind on um, what, maybe what your expectations are as one of our customers and two as a, as a consultant. 
Absolutely. as one who and I mean one who's been in the space. Um, what what are the things or what are the low hanging fruits you suggest? You know, Absolutely. the things you see. Um, we should do. Okay, so let me engage you a bit on this. Um, have you been following the discourses around those who've been picketing and they're not happy and they had this and they had that and the story changed and it's like, have you been following those? Th 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 that's not institutional. I'm talking about Ministry of Finance type issues. Have you been following these discourses? Oh, absolutely, I have. The pensioners, oh. you know, okay. getting oh, in the various groups. Absolutely. Have. have you noticed that nine out of ten times, whenever the thing heats up and really escalates, one of the often mentioned challenges is communication. Have you noticed? They said this, they'll do that. They didn't tell us this, they are doing that. They, they didn't tell us or they told us half. Have you noticed that communication seems to be at the heart of a lot of the, 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 the heat that's been generated? Have you noticed that? I have noticed, Prof. Fantastic. Okay. So please, um, I'm sure you know the adage about how to fetch water when your neighbor's beard is on fire, right? Sure. Fantastic. So for every financial services institution in this town, bank, non-bank financial institutions, insurance companies, central bank, national insurance commission, securities and exchanges commission, discount houses, my brother, this is the best time to align the customer experience team with the corporate comms team. Because when all is said and done, three things are at play here. One, people are insecure. Two, people are confused. Three, people sometimes feel they are being deceived. So when you have these three explosive um, um, conditions, my brother, you have to buckle down as a financial services firm and start to imagine life beyond this crisis. Start to imagine ways by which you can get people to accommodate the suffering in communication that alleviates the pain and gives them hope for tomorrow. Abrasiveness, it's not my fault, don't come and disturb me, it cannot be your portion. I sit on the board of Edifund, and you can imagine that it's been a very tumultuous time for us. Anytime we go for, but I ask my friend Jill, Jillian, Charlie, how? So the communications how? Jillian will say, Prof, we all need to. Then she will detail step one, step two, step three, step four, step five to keep the customers at bay so that, you know, we, we can tide ourselves over this rough patch. And then when it's all settled, we hope that the customers will still be there, the mutual fund will still survive, and then the blessing will come. So here's what it is. The quality of our communications at this time should be laced with empathy and extreme knowledge levels to be able to assure the customers that beyond this tumultuous phase, the aeroplane will still land and that there will be no crashing. What is beyond your um, purview, what is macro level that you can't control, you can't quite speak to it, but in the scheme of what you can control, assure them, calm them down, and use the most sophisticated communication techniques possible to keep them safe. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Prof. My pleasure, sir. I want a female question or comment, and then my whole day will be made. Where are the ladies? I was going to say all the single ladies, but it doesn't sound correct. So where, where are the ladies? I saw my senior sister, Barbara, here. Babs, are you still here? Let me just greet you. Babs, are you still here? Prof. from you. <laughs> Enjoying the discourse. Good to God hear from you, you too. Absolutely. Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you, too. <laughs> Move on now. <laughs> okay. So nobody else. Oh, so the ladies, you even say hi so that I can go and sleep. Where is Victoria? Is Victoria here? 
Is there anybody who was born on Wednesday? If you are here, just say hi. The ladies here. We are here. We are here. Oh, please. Who is speaking? I know one lady. Hi. Speaking. Hi. Madam. Hi. Ah, hi, madam. bro. Oh, oh, it's working. Oh, it has worked. Oh. Prof, you said you should say hi, so we are saying hi. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. Oh, <laughs> hi, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Oh. Oh, are you a lady? Who was that one? <laughs> are you a lady? I want only the ladies <laughs> to say hi. <laughs> hi, Hi, bro. hi, hi. hi. Yes, hi, Shelly hi. here. <laughs> just wanted to say thank you for this uh, it's quite a refreshing one for us it's been a long time we heard your voice so this was a good one thank you yes. hi 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 i'm dr vegan here oh hi good to have you madam hi prof good evening hi, Good evening, madam. Leila Pinto here. Another deep, deep, deep one. I'll never miss your lecture for anything. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. <laughs> indeed. indeed. Did you raise your hand? Kenneth? I saw one hand up. It was a, it was a male name. Is there a Kenneth here? Yes, please. Yeah, can you don't want to say something. We can close with you. Yes, please. Um, thank you for the delivery, but um, I would want to ask, how do we go around this racist thing that is also entering the customer service thing? What Racist? Do you say racist? Yes, please. Of we have seen some... Yes, please. Hey, okay, explain it to me. What's happening? So what happens is some business owners and based who are owning businesses in Ghana, once we have also researched our corner, they have a way of um, doing racist, this racist thing with um, the Africans when they want to enter the premises, the kind of treatment they give to the expatriates and that of the Africans. Oh, really? Yes, oh, I didn't know this. So they treat foreigners better than Ghanaians when you go to their places of work. Is that what you're saying? Yes, please. Uh, but can I please? Why, why, why do you still go there? What, what they are selling is it like some medicine that if you don't take, you die? But why do you still go there? Can I? No, it's a concern, um, which is raised by friends who are working at the front desk of and they really want to push to speak to their bosses on how oh, okay. some of their friends are feeling and they are expressing to them, but because okay. they are making it silence, but then oh. the front desk people also find it extremely difficult to come up with a plan since their bosses are not given such access or some kind of treatment to that. I see your point. Okay, okay. So the front desk people feel as if the organizations treat the, the non-Africans better than the Africans and they are not comfortable. Yes. But yes. because the organization is pushing that agenda, they are forced to also toe the line. I, I guess that's what you're saying. Yes, yeah, so they want to treat customers fail, but then because of their bosses silently giving that kind of special treatment and giving the other way, they they are trying to find ways of trying to bridge the gap, even how to communicate with their boss to understand this customer okay. service thing very well. Okay, that's so what this one I will use. Have you have you uh, watched How to Be a Millionaire before? Lifeline, you know, Lifeline. I'll use my Lifeline right now. So please, does anybody have experience with multinational, local, and what Kenneth is describing? I have some ideas, but it would be good to hear some of you as well. Can anybody give me a sense or some ideas? How do we take our racist tendencies in customer experience delivery in Africa? Kenneth, is that your baby? No prof. Ah, so whose mic is on? Okay. So Kenneth, here's what it is. I think that it's unfortunate that we we'll discuss this in Africa. Even though I have seen Africans also gravitate, fall under, kneel down to 
non-Africans, and then when their brother comes, they are rather mean and nasty to them. So I'm, I'm happy that you say in your situation, is the Africans who want to treat the other Africans well, but their bosses are preventing them. Okay, let me tell you what to do. No, no, no fight at all. These are fondest people. Can they write? Do you know how to write? Or they just use their mouth to complain? Do you know how to write? Like, write to explain the benefits of everybody getting the same treatment. Can, can they write? Yes, please. Okay. Then what they need to do is that if they have evidence of the African customers complaining, they should take some of it in writing and use that to make a small petition to management to amend the methodologies for the way they treat their customers. Number two, if they have a customer service or customer experience team, they should appeal directly to the head of the customer service customer experience team to also try and intervene. Number three, if they have better options, they can also change jobs. But that's the last resort. Because there's nothing more debilitating than going to a work you're not happy with. Every day you die inside, I think it's a bit of a problem. So those are my three board recommendations for your colleagues, and I wish them all the best. I saw one other hand up. Barrett, okay. oh, we are done. Yes, Prof. Yeah, I'm from Daniel Asari. Daniel, yes, Daniel. Prof, yes. Yes, sir. My hand is up, please. Thank ahead, you, Daniel. Prof, for, for the insightful presentation. My, I don't know whether it's a comment or maybe, but something to pick your mind. <laughs> Isn't it the case that in most instances, especially coming from a service industry, when we talk about customer experience, we tend to focus on the functionalities or whatever we are offering more than the actual experience. Uh, and then the second bit, in most cases, I don't see us also involving the customer in even defining the experience. We assume and then we bring it out and say, hey, this is it. And we expect that the customer should just take it. What, what are your thoughts on this point? Good point. I'll start with the second before I go to the first. All excellent services are co-produced. Let me repeat. All excellent services are co-produced. So you must get a keen sense of what the customer wants before you go and configure the bundle of solutions to amaze the customer. So as for delivering us what the customer wants, it's not even something we have to discuss on this webinar. It's totally off, totally inappropriate, even though shockingly, it is still fairly common. So that's why we're here today, so that we can all repent and find a good way forward. Your first issue is people concentrate on the functionalities, the hard part, the product, and then they neglect the service side, which is the real juice, if you like. Well, I don't know when you joined, but I tried to make a distinction between what I called traditional and contemporary customer experience approaches. And I said, those organizations who operate like you described are those who sometimes see customer experience as cost. Cost, everything, how much, how much, how much. And it's seen as a short-term transaction. Those are the ones who don't focus on the service overlay when it comes to even the selling of hard products. Then the next traditional group are those who see customer experience as necessity. They do it only because some other competitor is doing it. If you really want to come to the cutting edge there and make customer experience front and center, then customer experience will be seen as either one, delivering competitive advantage, or two, which is the highest form or expression of customer experiences, where you are delivering branded customer experiences. And this becomes the living expression of the corporate brand at every single customer touch point. So that's where we should all be moving towards. Customer experience is the essential living expression of the organization brand. That's what we should all do. So I agree with you. We shouldn't be traditional. We need to move into contemporary approaches. Thank you. So please, tonight too, it's important. It's important. To, it's important to explain that we are 
We are on ABC News TV. Very, very important to say that. And so we would encourage you to consume that particular platform because they have the most innovative programs. And if there are no more questions, then I'll ask one of my lady friends to give a vote of thanks. If there are more questions, I'll take them as well. Thank you. Hello, Prof. Yes, please. Yes, um, OK, so my name is Elsie. And I just wanted to uh, ask a follow up on the gentleman's question on the uh, foreigners treating the Ghanaians badly when they come to their shops. So I wanted to find out, is there a body that uh, these customers can report to? Because, um, I mean, you can't come to our country and then treat us badly. You can go on social media to vent some of your anger and all of these things, but because they don't even want you there, they may not even mind you if you go and vent your anger on social media. So I just want, is there a body in Ghana where maybe if you're a customer, you're being treated wrongly, that you can go to and then uh, report your case there, and then these organizations can be sanctioned or something like that? Elsie, what secondary school are you in? <laughs> okay, I went to Motown. I went to Motown. Are you serious? I'm very pleased to meet you. You know I went to Achimota School as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you didn't know? I know, sir. I'm so happy because you've asked the best question and has something to do with Auntie Barbara to went to Achimota. I'm sure you heard her earlier. So here's what it is. Two years ago, we wrapped up a certain project called two or three. It's called the BUSAC Fund, the Business Sector Advocacy Challenge. We gave over $10 million to several business associations in Ghana, LC, to try and get them to improve advocacy to critical duty bearers. So these duty bearers will create a more conducive environment for conducting business in Ghana. Madam LC, one of those we supported was the famous Kofi Capito. Have you heard of Kofi Capito? He has been chasing yes. something called the Consumer Protection Bill for years. Oh, We've been funding Kofi Capito, funding Kofi Capito. At one point, it's the Ministry of Trade. At one point, it is here. I hear now it's about to go. To, I, I heard the Minister Jinapo saying it's going to Parliament or it's going to Presidential Accent, something. Madam, my, my prayer is that sooner than later, this Consumer Protection Bill will come about because I think under the auspices of that bill, there's, there's some consumer protection authority we are supposed to set up as well. In, in places like the UK, they have such institutions where if you feel you've been traumatized as a customer, that you go and report there and remedial action is taken. So my answer to you would be twofold. One, I pray, you can pray with me since you went to Achimoto that this consumer protection bill will be passed quickly so we have an effective place to go and have our issues redressed. But two, I've been told, and me, I'm not a lawyer, I've been told that in the scheme of the normal laws and things in our country, there are still some consumer safeguards for if you are treated inappropriately. I, I don't know them. I, I'm humble enough to say I don't know them. But my only challenge with falling on those legal safeguards is that, Elsie, think about it. What are you going to say? Please, when I went, he, he, he sent me late because the white man came before me. Um, I'm not too sure. So we need that consumer protection bill like yesterday, and I'm praying that it's passed soon. That's where uh, our salvation will lie. And that's what I can say for that, Elsie. So where, where do you work, Elsie? I work at Gibbs. Ghana Interbank Payment and Settlement Systems Limited. Oh, with Archie Hesse, the famous Archie Hesse. Is he there? <laughs> Yes, he is, please. All right. Congratulations and well done. Anybody else on this ABC? What's it, let, let, me, let me be sure of the name before I make mistakes. Oh, yeah, ABC. ABC. Oh, Bernard. Bernard. Hello. Yeah, Bernard. Hello. Good evening, Prof. Uh, this is uh, Bernard. Uh, can you hear me? Very much, sir. Very much. 
Okay, so um, I have a question uh, uh, just emanating from the conversation that obvious you started with, uh, where you had highlighted that customer experiences should be seen as uh, uh, as strategic business drivers. Um, just, um, but in that light, uh, there was an example that you illustrated uh, that obviously is usually conducted by shop floor workers, which is uh, job swaps, and we see that executives sometimes shun some of these uh, moves where um, uh, executive suite staff fail to get involved in some of these. And then you see that um, because they are not fully involved, you find that um, the creation of sil silos tends to emanate from there because your shop floor workers or your operational staff are fully involved in some of these uh, initiatives, but the executive is just signing off on the uh, on the final decision without fully getting involved. How do we get uh, the C-suite to be the forerunners or the champions of such initiatives so that we can have some of these um, driving the business, basically uh, customers, uh, customer experiencing, being a, a, a strategic business uh, driver? My brother, I thought that uh, LC, from Achimoto School and ask the best question, but it looks like yours is even better than Elsie's. Sir, please, I want to respectfully announce to you that in the C-suites, if you don't have a chief customer experience officer, then please, is the job of the senior most marketing person or the chief marketing officer to drive the customer centricity in the C-suite. I am fully convinced is the only way to go. Because if we don't have a chief customer experience officer driving a relationship mindset, telling the C-suite we learn to we need to learn proactively about customer experiences, telling the C-suite follow the data, telling the C-suite make employees' life easier. Telling the C-suite, support customer experience with actual resources, not just lip, lip service. Telling the C-suite, close the loop between customer expectations and actual experience delivery. Telling the C-suite, we need to have a collaborative mindset so we can break down silos. Telling the C-suite, we need to work to align all facets of the brand with the experience the brand is creating. Telling the C-suite, emphasize customer obsession over campaign creation above the line, below the line, digital, this and this. Telling the C-suite that, look, the voice of the customer matters. My brother, if you don't have the chief customer experience officer or the CMO driving this agenda, no miracle can happen in the C-suite. So to answer your question directly, it is the job, the chief customer experience officer or the chief marketing officer to pivot the whole C-suite to the customer, break down silos and achieve high customer centricity. It's the only way to go. I hope I've answered your question. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. That is satisfactory. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, clients, are we done now? Yes, so thank you very much, Prof, and for the amazing questions that came through. I'm sure our history is still going to have the same way of approaching to how we can provide the intended value that we have traditional methods of emphasize delivering exceptional products, providing However, in the age of digital disruption and empowered consumers, contemporary approaches have been limited to tablet and digital digital driven less omni channel experiences, AI and automation revolutionize how organizations engage with customers. I think in all of this we still forget Thank you so much for the 
Africa Station this is powered by ABC News in Santi and Ghana. We've been live on AB News Station. I wish you all a wonderful evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you to ABC TV News as well. God bless us all and good night. Good night, Prof. Good night, Prof. Good night, Prof. Good night from Zambia. Good night, Prof. Martin from Zambia. Good night, Prof. I've, I've missed everything. <laughs> Good night, Prof. Good night, Prof. Good night, everyone. Elsie, hi. Solo, Good hi. Night. Good night. Hello. <coughs> Good night. Elsie, can you hear me, please? Hey, Harrison, how are you doing? I'm doing good. <laughs> good night. <laughs> Good night and thank you so much.